Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. My name is Arlene Sachs. This is Sally Ann Sachs. And today we'd like to welcome Dr. Mark Ozier. Welcome, Mark. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. He's just written a book called The Litvak Legacy, which uh, you might be able to see in the background of us, but we'll hold the book up in a few minutes anyway. And uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about that today, I think, uh, and uh, the, the legacy of the Jews coming from that area. You know, before, before we get started, since this is a genealogy show, I think what we want to tell our viewers is that, as they say in history, context is everything. And in order to understand our family's history and to know not only where to look for records, but how to understand them when we find them, we have to understand their background, their culture. And as that's really what this book is about, isn't it, basically? That's right. And what I found in giving lectures on the subject is people would come up to me and say, now I understand why my family was the way it was. I didn't know how they came to be that way. Right. So tell us about the Litvak legacy. Well, when you think about it, from about 1880 to 1930, about a million Lithuanian Jews, that is Litvaks, let, left Lita, the area in the Jewish Pale of Settlement in Imperial Russia, to go all over the world. And the question is, what is the legacy of that emigration? How, does it, how did it affect the millions, several millions of possible descendants of that original million emigration? And to what extent, how did, where, where did they come from? What was the character of the culture and the place they came from? And what impact did that have over the next hundred years on their descendants? Well, this is fascinating. What, what made you start doing this? Well, it's a long story, of course, but it was a labor of love and a labor of duty. Because uh, when my father died, he asked that his ashes be brought to uh, Lita, where his family had come from. And we brought my, my brother, my wife and I, came to Vilnius, brought his ashes, and went to Ponar, forest where the people had been killed. And visiting there was such an emotional experience, not a pleasant one, of course, but a very strong emotional experience. I felt I must do what I can to memorialize those of us who lived, not only those who were killed, but those of us who lived and who contributed to the world coming from that culture and brought it to the rest of the world. You make the assumption that there was that, that there was something very distinct about this group then. Right. Well, I thought I thought there was, but I, I wasn't sure. And uh, as I worked with the material, I found that one we know that they had a different variant of Yiddish. They spoke with a different accent. Different they, from different from all other Jews. Uh, there, we could talk about that more fully later on. But that was one thing. The second thing, and perhaps much more important, was the fact that they differed in terms of their religious character. They were, they sort of adhered to what we call, quote, rabbinical Judaism, unquote, rather than Hasidism and so forth. So there was this very distinct religious character that differed from other Jews elsewhere, particularly in uh, Poland. Uh, and thirdly, and most important for our purposes, is that the area was different economically. It was affected in a different way, so that the numbers of people who were living in the larger towns was greater than there was than was true about other areas in the Pale of Settlement and elsewhere. The number of Jews, I mean the percentage of Jews from Lita who were living in cities as opposed to the little towns, which we called shtetls, they, they had begun to move to the cities. Correct. So that would make it easier for them to come to the United States to oh, right. Once they have already broken out of the traditional living in the, in the smaller towns, the, there was a breakdown of the culture in terms of traditional culture. There was more interest in possibly going elsewhere once you had broken out of, broken out of the shtetls. I, and what years are we talking, what, what's well, the beginning of well, this story? Well, we, cal we calculated from 1880 to 1930, that 50-year period, 
course, the uh, immigration to the U.S. was cut off essentially in 1924. Right. But immigration carried on to South Africa and elsewhere into to 1930. And then after 1930, of course, all immigration was cut off even to Palestine, which was under British rule at the time. So we're talking about that era. But the book describes what goes on in Lita, in Lithuania, uh, through, through the Holocaust, which I don't call the Holocaust, I call the Shoah. Yes. <laughs> so it, we talk about the era until 1945. Now you, you showed us in the book that, that the Jews seem to break down into four general categories of, of paths that they follow. Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Well, I think the, in order to understand what these people brought with them when they did immigrate, it's important to understand what went on during the 19th century. Yes. And this is where the book starts. The book starts essentially with, the, uh, with 1800, when the Vilna Gaon had just died. And the, we're talking about the residue of his legacy for the 19th century. We should explain that he was... Who was he? Yes. <coughs> the Vilna Gaon was the leading figure who opposed Hasidism and maintained the character of rabbinical Judaism within this area which we call Lita, which, uh, which is just the northwest provinces of the Jewish Pale of Settlement. And we'll have a map later on that will go into more detail about that. But during the 19th century, the original traditional Judaism that was uh, true throughout began to evolve differently. As I said, Hasidism was true for, for the area of the Ukraine and for Poland, but was not true for these Northwest you provinces. Know, Mark, I'm thinking lest we run out of time, we should probably show that map now to, mm -hmm. to explain that what we're talking about is what I call Litvak land. Not only includes present-day Lithuania, but also includes Belarus yes. and probably much of Latvia. Yes. Right. Well, more, more. Let's see the map, and then yeah. we can talk about it more. Oh, there, the map's on the screen now. Right. You see that darker area uh, toward the north of the Pale of Settlement, and to the left of that is Poland. Now, Poland uh, was administered somewhat differently from the Pale of Settlement. So we will not be talking about Poland. We'll be talking about Lita. Now Lita are these six provinces toward the north of the Pale of Settlement. As you can see, south of those is the, are the provinces of the Ukraine, and then even more south are the provinces around Odessa and Bessarabia. However, the northern provinces, there are six provinces which are the ones that we're talking about. These are the province of Kovna, of Vilna, of Vitebsk, of, uh, of uh, the uh, Vitebsk, Grodno, Minsk. and Minsk. Minsk. We left out one. Was there one for Latvia? No. no that was, was outside the yeah, pale. Yeah, that was outside the pale, actually, although Jews from Lithuania were coming into that area. I think well, the important thing is that these were the provinces that consisted, that that made up Lita, and this is and the, the area where the culture and the Litvak culture, as we defined it, right. in terms of its variant of Yiddish, in terms of its religious character, and in terms of its economic organization. So, <coughs> tell us the, what are some of the most interesting aspects, or things that what, you what, did? What, what, yeah, what did the four? What did your research demonstrate? Well, the thing that I, that I found out, which was quite interesting to me, was the fact that the most of the early immigrants that left uh, the Pale of Settlement were from this area. So they're the ones who came to the United States as well as other countries early on and therefore set some of the characteristics became true for the American Jewish community as well as the community in the UK and South Africa and even in Canada. So that's one thing that really was surprising to me because I had not been aware of that. Uh, so that they were the early immigrants, they were the largest number of early immigrants, and after 1905, there were larger numbers who were coming from elsewhere in the Pale. 
but the group from 1880 to 1905 was to the greatest extent from Litep. The reason for that is that they were close to the border. They could be smuggled across into Germany, and once they got into Germany, they could be taken by train or whatever to the seaports that would bring them to the, to the US and to the UK and to Canada and to South Africa as well. But that's the one thing that I found out that was really of a great interest to me. Also, the UK community was uh, of East from Eastern Europe was also largely from Litte, which again, I don't think has ever been uh, made much of in terms of understanding how the UK community evolved. Of course, uh, the, the, I always knew that there was a very large Lithuanian component in the Jews of South Africa, but I didn't realize to what extent that was 90 the case. Some percent. Yeah, 90 yeah. some percent. And I even found, uh, so that's one thing that I learned that was a really, really surprising. And from there, I, I went on to other things. Uh, the other thing that I learned was how different Canada is from the US. Growing up in the United States, we always think of Canada as just another brand of, the, of America, but it really is not. It's quite different. And uh, I learned that to a very great and, and degree. And the Litvak community was very different in Canada? No, it, what, the, what there was of the Litvak community, because the Litvaks were a percentage, just as they were in the US, but the uh, immigration to Canada came about later from that to the United States. It really didn't start till around 1900. So it went on from 1900 to 1920. So it was somewhat later than the big immigration to the US, which started in the 1880s. If I said to you, if I, in our, my parents were what we called a Jewish mixed marriage, half Litvak, half Galicianer. But if, so if I said to you, what's a Litvak? What are some of the characteristics of a Litvak as you studied this? Did, did your studies? What, what comes to your mind? What, what do you think of? Well, in addition to the different aspects of the religion, which is really quite important in terms of Hasidism versus Mignagim, yes. which is the group where we're in opposition to Hasidism, in addition to the religious thing, there was uh, a great deal of difference in terms of the degree of secularization. So the group that came, that emigrated, tended to be those who were and already in the larger towns. They had already broken away from some traditional Jewish uh, religious uh, commitments and had begun to uh, develop a, a more secular approach, which evolved, of course, into socialism and Zionism and the combination of both, which is labor Zionism. Also, there was uh, the devotion to the study of the scriptures and the Talmud and the Torah, which was so strong in Litta, uh, became evolved again with secularization into a commitment to literary and historical studies, both in Hebrew and in Yiddish, which again was different from the rest of the Pale of Settlement. And the rest of Eastern Europe. Yeah, right, right. The degree of commitment to study, which had been based on the religious study, the famous Lithuanian yeshivas, what we all know about that was in Yentl and so forth and so on, but with uh, Barbara Streisand and so forth that's been written about, this was a very strong thing. And the yeshivas in Lithuania, in Lita, I'm going to use the word Lita rather than Lithuania because Lithuania is a very small country, and we're talking about a larger area than modern-day Lithuania. We're talking Belarus and Lithuania and portions of Latvia and also portions of what is now, what became Poland and so forth. So we're talking about Lita, and that's the definition that we want to use uh, from the map that we showed earlier. Uh, but whatever. Well, now, well, go ahead, <coughs> So, So you're saying that f sort of from the rabbinic uh, past, the Jews became either socialist or the, the uh, Zionism. Zionism and, and uh, more st studious. The, the, the emphasis on scholarliness, I think, as, as I have thought about it over the years and looked at my peers, seems that those with Litvak heritage were sort of 
geared toward being really studious students. The good, studying hard in your regular studies was seemed to be characteristic in the next generation. At least I think so. I don't know if you found that. Well, of course. Though, th this is what struck me because uh, here I didn't know anything about Lita, really. Uh -huh. Although my father uh, was from there, nothing much was made of it. My mother, of course, was from elsewhere. She was from the Ukraine. Yeah, yours was but, a mixed marriage, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I think it's very important that we're not talking about genetics here. We're not talking, we're talking about culture, which sort of went down through the generations. And as I said before, people would say to me, now I know why my family is the way it was. What, what was that? They, they were secular. They tended to be not religious, but more secular. They tended to be socialist to the extent there were socialism. And they also tended to be much more scholarly. Uh, in my family, for example, we had hundreds of books in the house. My father had not been well educated because the war had interfered with his education, but he wrote poetry, he wrote articles, he wrote stories. He was just, it just came through. And of course, I started writing history when I was seven years old. I, <laughs> I, yes. So, so as you've traced this Litvak legacy down in these various countries, let's hold up the okay. book too while we're while we're talking, and then they can decide to uh, show that on the screen if they want. Um, at the risk yeah. of offending other segments of Judaism, I have to tell you that once upon a time, I decided to look around and see how many high school valedictorians, Jewish ones, were, had Litvak ancestry. And I came to the conclusion that it was a disproportionate number. But it might have reflected that we are a larger group in the United States. So, but there is this emphasis on study, I think, that seemed, at least in the United States, to carry through. And I thought that was so, sort of for all first generation, first, second generation Jews. I uh, didn't really equate it to, to Lithuania. Oh, I shouldn't because over, but yeah, in terms of businessmen, you're more likely to find business, Jewish businessmen, I think, among the Galicianers, but I could be wrong. But well, Bronfman in, in Canada was a Romanian. Oh, okay, we got him too. So it, in terms of the character of the lit box as you found them, um, well, how do you explain the Zionism, which was so strong in South Africa, for example? Um, Herzl wasn't a Litvak. How did Zionism grab hold, do you think? Well, both in Canada and in South Africa, Zionism was the very first uh, organizational uh, characteristic of those, Jew of those Jewish communities. That is, before anything else, they, they, uh, Zionism, of course, with Herzl in the, in the 1897, and then soon thereafter, uh, these things began to grow up in Canada and South Africa early on. And both Canada and South Africa are, were relatively Zionist. As I said, they started out, that was the organizational thing that started even before they had anything else, but also the character of the country. South Africa, if we can talk about that, South Africa, as you well know, uh, was uh, the white community in South Africa was split between the uh, Boer, uh, the uh, Afrikaners, and the Brit and the English, and the Jews were another tribe, if you will. They had to be very strongly identified as a group. Uh, being uh, Zionist in South Africa was not was not in some way a a matter of divided loyalties because. John Christian Schmutz, who was the premier in South Africa, had been a pro-Zionist. He had been in the war cabinet, which had issued the Balfour Declaration. Ah. So there was that element that it was okay to be a Zionist uh, because Schmutz had been one of the leaders. Also, as I said, there is this element of what country do you belong to? In South Africa, it was no sense of a national a unity, ah. because they had the split amongst the whites. You, of course, had the split between the blacks and the whites. So that there wasn't a sense of community ah. that you had to belong to, like in the United States. That was an issue of dual loyalties that was very strong, uh, it, strong, and it had to be dealt with in the United States with American Zionism and with British Zionism to some extent. 
but was not the case in South Africa. I see. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. So you are a retired neurologist, yes? That's correct. So here you are writing this big history book with lots and lots and lots of footnotes and notes. Where, what were your sources? How did you go about doing this? Well, I, I really dealt with the Library of Congress. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful organization? <laughs> uh, the Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress was very helpful. Ah. And uh, they, they would get me the books, and uh, I really depended on them. I remember going to Library of Congress right after September 11th. There were very few people there, but I was working there. <laughs> I was probably the only one in the reading room, but it was, I, I just carried on. I just, I loved what I was doing. I really enjoyed it. I learned so much, as you always do when you write something. I really enjoyed the whole thing. I'm, I'm looking at, how many years did this take you? Well, it's hard to tell because I, you know, I did it in spurts and I kept hoping to get a university press to publish it. So I can't tell you, but it was in 1997 that I went to Vilnius, uh, uh, to, uh, to the Ponar Forest. And it was over those years that I, 2001, I had finished most of it. But after 2001, as I said, I was writing the chapter on Canada in September and October of 2001. So it was really between 1997 and 2002 or something. Now you have a web page set up for the Litvak Legacy? Yeah, we just set up a web page. The book is just, I just received a copy of the book yesterday, the oh, first no. copy. This is the first copy. So I think the book will be for sale probably by the end of the month, we hope. And you can get information on it at www.thelitvaklegacy.com. And you can buy, make arrangements to buy books through www.exlibris. That's X-L-I-B-R-I-S, exlibris.com. Okay, well, we'll have a link both to your website and to the Exlibris site uh, from our webpage here which is uh, just tracingroots.nova.org, no www. Uh, that's the one where we describe all the shows, and we'll have links on that one to, to your website and to the escapers for you. So I'm, I'm looking at, the, at the, uh, the table of contents, as I always do, and I notice the, the, you talk about the exist, here, just for the United States, you talk about the United States as the nation of immigrants, the existing Jewish community, and the response to the Litvaks coming in? Is that one of the things yes. that you focused on? Was that something very noticeable that you could, had identifiable characteristics? Well, of course, in every one of these countries, the East European immigration, of which the people from Lita were, were a part, uh, was very, very much larger than the existing Jewish communities. Uh, this was particularly the problem in the United States, where there had been a substantial uh, Jewish immigration from what's called Germany. They weren't from Germany because Germany didn't, didn't exist, exist until 1871. German speaking. German speaking. And uh, they had come, uh, about 250,000 em uh, immigrants had come. Uh, by the time of 1880, these people had been fairly well established. And uh, there was some concern, as you might expect, for all these foreign types coming in speaking Yiddish, being more religious than the Reformed Judaism of the German Jews. And uh, there was a concern about what that would do to the image of Jews in the United States. There was anti-Semitism in the United States. As we know, uh, Judah P. Benjamin was uh, on the Confederate side, and then General Grant issued that famous, infamous Order 11, which uh, which was which applied to the Jews living in Kentucky and elsewhere as a class being driven out, being deported from from that area, from Paducah, Kentucky, and a number of other towns, uh, because they were concerned that they were trading in cotton oh. with the Confederates and so forth. This this went into effect and was was uh, uh, was removed by Abraham Lincoln. When he found out about it, it was brought to his attention by the Jewish leaders at the time. But there was concern about what this meant 
to the existing Jewish community, which had been fairly well established. In any event, despite that, there was support within the Jewish, German Jewish community for uh, continued immigration and for charity and so forth, tzedakah, for the people who were coming over. And Jacob Schiff, who was, if you will, the leader, uh, unofficial but unelected leader of the Jewish community in the United States at the time, he was, he was the major partner in the largest Jewish firm on Wall Street at the time, Kuhn Loeb and Company. Jacob Schiff uh, was one of the leaders in the Uptown Group, along with people like Strauss from Macy's and a number of other wealthy Jewish families, who saw to it that there was an opportunity for Americanization to occur, but to occur in such a way as to not uh, destroy the character of the, of the Jewish community. And the, one of their major activities was the support of the Jewish Theological Seminary, the building up of that under Solomon Schechter, and the development of, of conservative Judaism as a bridge between orthodoxy oh. and reform Judaism. I, I think <clears throat> what you've just said, it sounds like you've been talking a lot, <clears throat> but it's been very interesting. And I think it's important to see that, that whole picture of what was going on rather than just sometimes just focusing on, on one ancestor that we want to, want to see. So I think that this overall has given us a, a much larger picture of what was going on, what brought our ancestors, whether they were German or Lithuanian or, or somewhere else, and what was going on in the United States at the same time. So uh, just got a few seconds. I want to thank you very much right. for coming and, and, and being and, on and the show. And obviously this was a labor of love, and, and it's described by your peers as a pas passionately written book. So it must be also very interesting. Not a dry history book, I think. Yes. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much.